Hello students, I'm Dr. Isaac Mokona-Buga from the Department of Economics and I'm going to take you the course unit Intermediate Macroeconomics. The unit Intermediate Macroeconomics is for those students who have already studied about introduction to macroeconomics and now they are moving to the next level of trying to understand the, the, the models of macroeconomics. Now here we have this new unit and the objective of the course unit is to prepare students in the field of planning and building economic models and understanding national and world operations, that is the world economies. So at the end of the course unit, students are expected to be able to describe economic models, as well as applying those models in analyzing macroeconomic issues. So the important key topics which we are going to cover today, we have the national income accounting, consumption, saving, and investment, as well as the aggregate demand and aggregate supply function. Additional information can be got from the, uh, from the book of macroeconomics by Olivia Plachard, as well as macroeconomics by Doshpash Rudmentri. And there are also other more books which can be able to assist you in terms of understanding better about this course unit of macroeconomics. So to remind ourselves about the subject, macroeconomics is, is a branch of economics that attempts to analyze and explain the interrelationships between aggregate variables. Somewhere we say that microeconomics we are studying about small, uh, individual units. Now macroeconomics we are concerned about the mac, uh, that is the macro variables, or we are studying the economy as a whole. So every aspect we are dealing with here, we are dealing it at the level of the whole economy and not as an individual. If we are talking about consumption, we are talking about the consumption, the aggregate consumption, aggregate investment, aggregate income, aggregate population, and etc. So we are looking about all those aspects in terms of the whole economy or the whole country at large. So macroeconomic models are simplified explanations of theories on how the economy works. We have different models. One is the, the consumption function, which we say is that C equals to A plus B1. Meaning that consumption is a function of income. So as the income if you look here, we have said C equals to A plus B1. From mathematics, we understand that we are talking about A is a constant, and B is what? It, it, that is, is a, is a parameter which measures the change. So if we try to increase the income by certain, that is by 1% or 1 shilling, we expect that the consumption will change by an amount of an amount of B. So by having a model like this, it, make, it simplifies the theory. Instead of writing the whole paragraph to explain how the consumption is related with income, we can present it simply by, by a model. Now, we have major goals for macroeconomics. One is to achieve full employment. That is how can an economy be able to provide jobs for all, it, all their citizens. Although no country has managed to achieve that full employment, but it's the duty of every government to try and ensure that the unemployment level has reduced. So the objective is to ensure that we are able to move closer or achieving full employment to achieve economic growth to ensure that we have more production, to ensure that our prices are stable, we don't have situations of inflation, as well as 
to ensure that our balance of payment, which represents the external balances, is also, is also doing well, or it is favorable for, for our country. Now, the national income accounting, which is very, very critical for any students of studying macroeconomics, it refers to the measurements of aggregate economic activities, particularly income and its components, of which income here is measured in terms of the GDP. From your introductory, introductory to macroeconomics, you might have studied about what GDP is, what GNP, what NNP is. In this case, when you are talking about the GDP, you are considering the total money value of goods and services produced in a country in a particular year. Since we are saying that D, or domestic, we are considering only those goods and services, or the money value of those goods and services which are produced within our territory, or the territory of the country. So in this case, we can use national income by presenting it in the form of the values we get from the GDP, or in some cases, if we are factoring in the money from abroad, we use the GNP, the gross national, the gross national product. GDP per capita, which relates to the total value of annual output to the number of people, or the average income of the people is referred as GDP per capita. Then we have the circular flow of, uh, flow of income, the circular flow of income model, which describes the flow of resources, products, and incomes among economic, economic actors. What is very important when you are talking about the circular flow it is how the goods and resources are moving from one particular sector to another. And that flow is given here, whereby we have different sectors. And in this case here, we have what we call as a, a, a model for an open economy. If you remember when you are studying about the introductory part, or the introductory to macroeconomics, they say that we have different sectors. We have a two-sector model, we have a three-sector model, and a four-sector model. So in this case here, we have a four-sector model, whereby we have the household, we have the farms, we have the government, and we have the rest of the world. And in macroeconomics, we understand that resources flow in the form of in a form of a circle. That is, what comes into the household, it is the same which goes out of the household. For example here, the household is considered to be housing the factors of production. Labor, capital, we have entrepreneur, as well as land. All they are within the household itself. So when the household offer their services to the farms, you know, uh, uh, within the circular flow of income, the arrows are very important. We have the consumption expenditure C here, which moves to the farms. And the farms also, they make payment. Not payment, I mean, but they offer the goods to the, to the household. And how do they get these goods? Out of the money they received by offering their service to the farms. So for example, I go to the farm, I work, I earn. After earning, I use the same amount to buy, to buy the goods. So even if I don't buy from the same farm where I've worked in, I'm going to buy from a particular farm. All in all, what I received, I've done what? I've spent. The same way happens with the government, the government gives transfers. Transfer is the money which the government gives to the, to, the, to the people or to their citizens. Like now, food relief, they can be offered in terms of money. Old age can be given out in terms of money and etc. So the government gives out the transfer, the transfers which becomes the income of the, of the household. 
the same household, they use that money by investing in the money market or by investing in the banks, which the government borrows from this particular bank. Or in some cases, the government can, can get uh, taxes from the, from the farm. In this case, we are assuming that it's only the farm which pays, pays the taxes. But in some cases, we also, in some books, they also present you whereby the household also they pay taxes to the government directly, like payee, which comes direct from, from, the, from the people. So, so whatever the government receives in the form of tax, they use the same amount of money in order to buy the goods as well as giving money transferred to the, to the household. It is expected that whatever they received, all of it will also again be, be spent. The same way happens with the rest of the world, where M presents the, presents the import and X presents the export. So it's expected that the rest of the world, whatever we spend in importing the goods, this, the same we got from the exports of goods. We exported goods, we earned the money, and we used the money to export. So at any point, at any point we find that not all is received or not all is spent, then it means that there are two things in this cycle of flow of income. Either there is a leakage or there is an injection. So when the government when the government receives when the government receives funds from outside or from donors it becomes the, an injection to the economy because that money was not factored within our house the big house that is the country so it becomes an injection an excess which has to affect the whole circular flow now it will be a leakage if someone tries to save because when you save, it means that you have not spent the whole, the whole amount. And for those leakages, it, then again it requires that the leakages are supposed to be equal with the injections for the circular flow of income to continue operating the way it is being structured. <coughs> Sorry. Now, there is an equilibrium, the national equilibrium income of which we say is that equilibrium occurs at that point where the aggregate expenditure equals to the aggregate income. Now, why here presents the income or the output? Why here presents the income or output? So, the total income here should be equal with the total expenditure. These are the four sectors. We expand is that there is consumption expenditure, by the household, there is investment expenditure by the farms, there is government expenditure by the government, and the rest of the world also they are spending on exports and imports. So they are supposed to equate each other, they are supposed to be, they are supposed to be equal. Now we have Keynesian determination of equilibrium. A, a simple Keynesian aggregate demand function is given by Y equals to C plus I plus G. Now, in this particular uh, uh, model, we are presenting it in terms of a three-sector, a three-sector, a three-sector model. We can present it in the form of a two-sector model where we say Y equals to C plus I. Or we can present it as a four-sector model where we say Y equals to C plus I plus G plus X minus M. So, so C, we have said, is consumption, I, investment, and G is government expenditure. So, if we come up with these two equations, where we assume further that there is a function, uh, the functional relationship can be developed, whereby we say that, since we have said Y equals C plus I plus G, and C, we say it's a function of income, where we say that C equals to A plus B, Y. So for that reason, we, we can come up with the first equation where, uh, where we have it as C, uh, y equals to C plus I plus G. And the second one, that is C is equals to A 
plus dy. Now, to solve for the equilibrium, we substitute equation 2 into equation 1. Substituting here, it means that where we have C, we have to replace it with A plus dy. Where we have C here, we have replaced it with A plus dy. So, by doing that, the next thing is that we can try to, <coughs> to do what? To bring the like terms together. That is, this, this by will move out. Whereby we'll say y minus by equals to what? A plus I plus G. So that we can, we can have a new equation in this particular form. That is dividing both sides by 1 minus 1 minus B. So in this case we are saying that sometimes consumption is described as a function of Y. That is C equals to that and y equals to y minus t. We have taxes. Taxes, here we are considering the taxes on our personal income. So whatever we receive, just like on our pay slip, we have gross as well as we have the net. Now the net is what we are able to spend, the, our disposable income. So to get the disposable income is the total income which we deduct the, the taxes. For example, here we have, we are given, in this case we are given C, that is 160 plus 0 0.6 YD. Then we are having I, which is 150, G is 150, and, and T is 100. So in order to solve this, that is we need to get the value of Y. Here we have, that is, we have taken these figures, we have replace it with these uh, symbols we have here, whereby we have 160 plus 0 0.6 into brackets y minus 100 plus 150 plus 150. Why we are saying this, why y minus 100, is because for you to get disposable income, you have to get the total income which is presented by y minus the tax which is, which is 100. So, there is another stage which happens in between here for you to get the answer. That is, we open these brackets. That is, we have 0.6y, right, minus 60. That is 0.6 times 100 is what? It is 60. So now this 0.6y, it moves out. Since, it, since it's positive, we, it moves out here. That is y minus, because it's plus, when it moves the other side, it will be minus y minus 0 0.6 equals 160 plus 60. Not plus 60, but minus, minus 60. Because here it becomes still a minus, minus 60. So 160 minus 60, which is, remains 100, plus 150, that is 450, plus this, 350 plus this, it comes to 400. So what happens is that here when we deducted y minus 0.6y, we got 0.4, 0.4y. So it is 0.4y which is equal to 400. And if you divide 400 by 0, you divide it by 0.4, it gives you the 1,000. That is uh, our equilibrium income. So if we tell you to calculate the equilibrium income, this is what we get here. That's why we put it YE, E presenting equilibrium income. Now, in order to get the disposable income, I've said, disposable income is the total income minus the tax, of which we have taken 1,000 minus 100. Of course, 100 was given already here, up here as the tax, which gives our disposable income to be 900. Then there is another important thing which you need, to un uh, we ne you need to understand, that is the multiply, of which we say it represents the number by which the shift in the aggregate spending function must be multiplied to determine the change in the level of income 
and output required to be stapling a new equilibrium. How many times a particular investment we have made will be able to increase the initial income? Of which we can present the multiplier by saying it is delta Y divided by delta I. All change in income due to change in investment. And in some case, they can present it in, in this particular form, where multiplier, which is represented by K, is equal to 1 divided by 1 minus MPC. Now, what is MPC here is the marginal propensity to consume. Marginal propensity to consume. And marginal propensity to consume is the fraction of the total income which is spent on which is spent on consumption. So the less we spend on consumption, the more we invest and the more it's able to generate, to generate the income. Then we have the accelerator. Accelerator theory states that any given increase, any given increase in spending will lead to a greater percentage increase in investment spending. That is, the level of investment depends upon the rate of change and resultant change in consumption. Now, the accelerator tries to explain that how much induced investment will be changed by autonomous investment through the MPC, the marginal propensity to consume which means that it, it goes further from the multiplier. That is, the multiplier we have said is that if we increase the autonomous investment, it leads to the increase in income. Now, when the income increases, it goes for further investment, which we call induced investment. We are saying induced investment because it was, or it changed because of the change in income. So this induced investment is expected to increase further. It is expected to give us a further increase in the, level of, in the level of income. Then we have, <coughs> sorry, the next topic is about the consumption, saving, and investment, of which we, when we talk about consumption, or a consumption function, we say it is the relationship between the level of consumption and the level of income. And we have the average propensity to consume, which is the total, that is the total income divided by the total level of consumption. Then we have the marginal propensity to consume, which I've already said that it is the, uh, the, the fraction of that income which is spent on which is spent on consumption then we have the saving function also which is also possibly related with the income that is as the income increases also the saving is expected to increase then average propensity to save that is the total the total saving divided by the income as well as the marginal propensity to save that is the fraction of that income which is spent on saving. And it is presumed that the total income will be spent in consumption and saving. If it's not consumed, it is saved. And whatever is saved, we are assuming that it is invested. So that's why we are saying that MPC, or the marginal propensity to consume, plus the marginal propensity to save equals to one. One referring to the total, to the total income. What determines the consumption? Your consumption is expected to increase depending on the level of income. As the income increases, the consumption increases. The rate of interest affects the consumption. If the rate of interest is high, less borrowing and less consumption. Relative prices, when the prices increase, they reduce the purchasing power, so you are expected to consume less. Capital gains, it increases the consumption. Wealth, the more wealth, the more you consume. More credit, the more easily, uh, the more 
credit is easily available the more you are expected to consume. The distribution of income, if it is fairly distributed, it increases the consumption and the composition of population or the demographic pattern, in some cases that's what they call it. The demographic pattern or composition, uh, uh, composition of population is in terms of the young, the working class, as well as the, the old. If the working class, they are more than the old, then the cons uh, consumption is expected to be high. Then we have theories of consumption. Now, the theories of consumption, they try to explain how is consumption related with the level of income. We have four theories. One is the absolute income hypothesis, which try to say that the level of consumption depends entirely on your total income you receive. That is a function of income. The more income you receive, the more consumption is expected to happen. Then the relative income hypothesis says that Instead of the absolute income you receive, what matters on your consumption, it is the average income of the people who are within you. If majority of the people of your class are consuming a particular amount, you are also tend to consume the same. But the permanent income hypothesis, which was put forward by Feynman in 1957, states that consumption depends on permanent income which is defined as the present value of the expected flow of income. That is, people don't consume on the basis of how much they have earned today, but how much they will be earning even in the future. <coughs> so if they're expecting that their income is going to increase in the future, then they will factor it when it comes to consumption. But if they know that even if they are earning more now, in the future it will decrease, then they will tend to, earn, uh, to consume less. Then we have the life cycle income hypothesis, which was formulated by Modiglian and Prunbach, which states that consumption is a function of the expected streams of disposable income over a long period of time and the present value of wealth. Actually, we say it's a combination. It factor in also the permanent income hypothesis. So we say that is the improvement of the income uh, uh, hypothesis, permanent income hypothesis, which says that a person makes a decision on his level of consumption depending on the future flow of income as well as the, netted, the net present value of his or her wealth. So also investment, is also another important thing, which we say that investment means the additional stock of in the economy, and we have two key types of investment, although they can be subdivided in different ways, but in most cases, we take investment to be either autonomous investment or induced investment. Induced investment is the investment in the private sector, which is done on the basis of a number of factors. That is, those factors are the ones which dictate whether you have to invest or not. Then we have autonomous, which is public investment, which does not depend on the economic variables. Investment can be influenced by the interest rate, internal rate of return, expected future income. For example, the interest rate, if it is low, then more people will be able to borrow and invest. Internal rate of return, if it is high, it encourages you to invest. Expected future income flows increases the, uh, the chances of investing. Initial cost of capital, if it is high, it discourages investment. The degree of uncertainty, if it is high, it discourages investment. The level of income, the more income you have, the more likely you are to invest. Business expectations, if they are optimistic about business, the investment also will be high. As well as the existing stock of capital, the more you have, the more likely you are going to, you are going to invest. 
Then we have a, a very important concept of aggregate demand. Aggregate demand was developed by James Keynes, that is after depression, that is in 1936. He came up with the concept of aggregate demand under the, uh, the principle of effective demand, which occupies a key position in the Keynesian theory of employment of which we say is that effective demand is the ability and the willingness to spend by individuals, firms, and government. So the level of output, and hence the level of employment, depends on the level of total spending in the economy. So when we talk about the aggregate demand, we say it's the total demand for all the commodities supplied in the economy. So this effective demand, is influenced by two things, that the aggregate demand and aggregate supply. But in this case, we are talking about the aggregate demand. James Keynes was concerned about the short-run period, and that's why he says that in the short-run period, you cannot be able to make an adjustment on the supply, but you can be able to adjust the demand, and that's why he focused more on the aggregate demand, which we have said that the aggregate demand is the total demand for all the commodities supplied in the economy. <coughs> Sorry. So the aggregate demand can be explained by the goods market and the money market. In the goods market, we have what you call as the investment saving function. The investment saving function here is try to explain that as your income increases, of course, you are expected to, to save more as well as you are supposed to invest more. And what happens is that when you are trying to connect, because we are saying that as the income increases, the saving and investment will increase the same way, of which we are assuming that the saving, the same amount saved is the same amount which is invested. So for that reason, we are saying that the IS curve is, is always downward sloping in the sense that as the income increase, as the interest rate, normally in economics, we consider what's on the, what's on the, the Y axis is what influences the, the X axis. So as the interest rate increases, it reduces the amount of investment which is presented in this particular form. So in the goods market, more investment can only happen at a lower interest and less will happen at the high, high interest rate. So the IS curve is downward sloping and we have the LM curve which is presenting the money market, of, we, of which the demand for money, according to Keynes, he says that the demand for money is required on the basis of three motives, we have the transactional motive, precautionary, and speculative motive. So the precautionary and transactional motive depends on the level of income. They say as your income increases, likely that you are going to spend more, transaction is going to increase. Also, you are going to keep more money for emergence. A poor person does not keep money for, for emergence. It's only rich people keep. So as your income increases, there's a likelihood that you can be able to keep some money for precautionary purposes or for emergency. Now, for speculative motive, is whereby you are demanding money in order to take, <coughs> to take up opportunities in, in the market in terms of investment. So in that case, the demand for money for speculative motive is influenced by the interest rate. So combining the three together, they say that at first, they say is that the supply of money is determined by the central bank, and since it's fixed by the central bank, they say it is fixed. That is downward sloping. Is the decision of the central bank a to release more money or less money? But the demand for money, it is influenced by the interest rate as well as the level of income. So. The, the demand for money will decrease up to a certain point, it remains to be slightly constant. 
Now, it remains constant because the market, in the market there is always a certain interest rate, which they expected that whatever investment which is done or whatever increase or decrease will tend to rotate around that particular point. Once the interest rate decreases to that point, it will never decrease further. It remains there. And that's whereby you are saying that equilibrium in the money market can only be determined at that point where the supply of money is equal with the demand for money and that is the particular point which is fixed there. So in this case now since the supply of money is fixed in the long run is expected to be upward sloping then we have the demand for money which in this case it remains to be, it re de decreases and remains to be constant. Then they say that the short term equilibrium that is both in the money market and the, uh, the goods market can only be achieved at the intersection of the curves, which gives a unique combination of income and interest rate. And the two curves they are presented here, whereby they are intersecting. Now, here we have the IS curve, and we are having, this one is supposed to be LM curve. L stands for the demand for money, and M stands for the supply of money, LM curve. So, at that particular point, we have the interest rates and the income. This interest rate is what we say the market interest rate. This is the market interest rate, which means that and uh, 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 that is a bank can have its own interest rate or any business can have its own interest but there's also the interest rate in the market which is determined by the market forces of demand and the market forces of demand and supply now the next thing is about the aggregate supply we have already seen the aggregate demand, and aggregate demand, we have made it clear that it is there. The consumption demand, investment demand, government demand, as well as the foreign demand, which are combined together, and which are also summarized in the form of the IS and LM, LM curve, in order to present that. So next we have the aggregate supply. Of course, I've told you that Keynes concentrated much on the demand side and it didn't concentrate on the on the supply side mainly because it was concerned with the short run period of which within that particular period you can only make adjustment on the on the demand side even currently when we are trying to address the 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 pandemic the other time we had parliament saying that they are taking up measures which will address the demand side as well as the supply side. For example, when they were reducing the taxes, they were expecting to increase our, our demand. When the government was trying to uh, supply, uh, giving transfers, they were trying to, uh, to address the, the demand. There's also the supply side where they were trying to reduce the VAT in order to make it uh, ch cheaper for the companies to be able to produce. So all those measures, they were focusing on this, particular concept of aggregate demand and supply. Now, the aggregate supply refers to the amount of goods supplied in the economy. The amount of goods supplied in the economy and the aggregate supply curve for each given price level, the quantity output of firms are willing to supply in the short term, that is the S curve is horizontal. That is, according to Keynes, he was presenting it as horizontal, as, the, as well as the classical, it is vertical, like the way we have seen it before, whereby the aggregate supply, it is, it is vertical. But both they try to explain that supply, it is fixed in the short term. Now, the difference is on the argument on what makes it to be fixed. <coughs> Sorry, according to Keynes, he tried to say that it is horizontal in, in, in the sense that 
the supply does not increase in the short run periods because of the stick wage, wages. The wages of the workers does not change. And for that reason, there is no more demand or more supply of workers. Workers will not be interested to work because of the wage rate is, is fixed. So for that reason, if the wages, if the workers remain the same number, also they are expected to produce the same amount of goods all through. So that's why he was assuming that the supply is fixed. For the classical, they were saying that the supply is vertical in the sense that it doesn't increase, mainly because the resources which are producing, of which they combine together the capital, the technology, they cannot be able to be adjusted within this particular period. So next we are trying to uh, give more reasons as to why the aggregate supply function is it's fixed, of which we have different models trying to explain the same. One is the sticky wage model, which try to say that the aggregate supply remains to be fixed because the wages are also fixed, cannot be changed within a short period. So if the wages are fixed, the supply of labor also remains to be constant. And if it is constant, then there will be no more ex extra goods to be produced. The worker's misperception also is another reason why the aggregate supply is fixed. Whereby the workers, they are not able to understand about the market. Whereby their wages can be increased, but also the prices of goods are also increased. But for them, they will think that the, 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 the wages have increased. But in the real, the real wage, because there is a difference between the money wage and real wage, when the increase in wages goes with the increase in prices, that one is an increase in the money wage. But the real wage is when the increase in, that is the increase in wages, leads to the more consumption of goods in the market. That is, the value of goods are, uh, you are able to get from the market, they are more. That's when we say that your wages have increased. So because of the perception between the workforce, the, whereby they, they, they think that their wages have increased without looking about the increase in the prices, you find that the increase in wages is countered with the increase in the prices and you find that everything remains to be the same. So the aggregate supply remains to be, it remains to be fixed. Now, the other reason is about imperfect information model, whereby they were, the people within the market itself, they are not able to get the correct information. When we say that there is imperfect information, it means that the information is not equally available within the market system, and for that reason, it remains to be fixed. And lastly is the stick, sticky price model, whereby the prices of the resources which are used to produce goods and services in the market are not able to adjust. And since they are not able to adjust, there is no likelihood of producing more goods within the market itself. So because of these listed models, we are able to understand why the aggregate supply is always, is always fixed. And that, uh, that marks the end of today's lesson. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then, email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.